Lord, when we touch you, when we touch you, when those moments break in, and we're so aware of all the, all the mind traffic, and we realize that we're worn out and we're tired, we're desperate, we're depressed, we're discouraged, we can move down the list, Lord. We just thank you for those moments where you break in and life comes to us and everything looks different everything looks different we look different our circumstances look different everything looks different because you're in the middle of it Lord we we're not interested in a, a religious meeting this morning we, we want to meet with you want to meet with you. Lord, we want to touch you. Just like this, the writer of this song. We don't want to just come and sing songs like this. And just we don't want to touch you more here with the saints than we do at home washing dishes. So Lord, this morning, I, I, just, want to, I just want to believe this morning for every person in this building that you are going to speak, you're going to have a word, you're going to touch, you're going to say something, something. You're going to touch every person in this room as we meet in this next day, these next minutes. You're the only one. You know every one of us. You know what we were thinking about when we put our head on the pillow last night. You know all the list of things we're trusting you for and all the things that irritated us yesterday and all, the, all of the fears we have and you name it, Lord. You know us. You're a person. Please forgive us for treating you other than a person. I wouldn't really be happy with my closest friends treating me the way we treat you sometimes, Lord. You're a person. You know us. You're not far away. You're on the throne. And you're in us on our throne. So this morning, Lord, more than, probably me than more, more than anyone, we need you this morning, Lord. We need you. We want to touch you. We want to touch you. Touch us this morning, Lord. T speak to us. You don't just talk to us in a mass, like a mob. Every one of us, you know personally, you know exactly what classroom we're in, what book we're up to, and how we did on the last test. And you're here, Lord, this morning. We, we want you this morning, Lord. And if we don't want you, then we want you to give us the power to want you. That's what we need. We need you to do it all, Lord. We need your life this morning. So we bless you for it. And we thank you. Now we're going to believe you for it, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. You may be seated. All that buzzing going on over here this morning was, hey, can I get some guys to kind of, oh, this isn't so hard to do. Oh, how come James always makes it look like it's a big deal? <laughs> what? Whoop. James, and, James and Meg are uh, a little further up a little bit, I think. James and Meg are getting a little quiet time this weekend together. That's, they need it. So that's good. Um, so we, we were buzzing over here because we were like, we expected 10 people to show up to church this morning. We knew with vacationing and a uh, number of reasons. And then there the, was reports, ice, not ice, whatever. So we were kind of like, well, we'll just get in and we'll see if there's 10 people. We'll just have the Lord's table and we'll, and we'll somebody's phone's up here. And uh, we'll go home. So I don't really know exactly what's going to happen this morning. Those of you who've been hanging around for a while, know me a little bit, know that that's true. Um, mm, it's so true. You know, this morning, I don't really want to talk to you as a pastor. I'm so glad to get rid of that title. You have no idea. I feel less and less, more like a mother and a grandmother to you than I am a pastor. So this morning, I really just want to kind of do that. I want to just share my mother's heart. Uh, 
again, I don't really know. I didn't know how far we were going to go. I was really, <laughs> Joe, we had some night last night, right? <laughs> if those are demons, I don't know what they were, but boy, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. So, yeah, I got to change something here for me. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. I'm going to have to get a stand-up desk for me here. Poppy, I need a stand-up desk. Uh, is there a, st I took that other stand-up desk home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to need, see, I thought I could see my iPad good like this, but then we don't put my Bible. Yeah, let's pull that over if you don't mind. Will that, will that hold the Bible? Yeah. Oh, it, oh, it moves, Joe. You know, Joe, you save us all the time, Joe. Thank you so, oh! Does James ever do this? Thank you. Does James ever do this? I've never seen him do this. Well, he doesn't know either. <laughs> Joey, he doesn't know either. Make sure you tell him. I remember my uh, spiritual mom, many of you knew her well, Jane Hale. She'd get up to the podium sometimes, and she'd be waiting on God, and she'd just, you guys remember? She'd just look up the ceiling or pray for 10 minutes, and we're like, oh, my God, I'm so nervous. I don't want to do that to you. I don't want to do that to you, but I am her daughter. I am her daughter. You know, as leaders, I'm talking for, talking to James, Joe, me, Naeem. There's a number of us talk, get together. More, we're going to have more um, clarity about that in the days coming. We're, we're not up here as individuals. You know, we're, we're seeking the Lord. Um, you know, when I started talking about the indwelling Christ, as I did two and a half years ago, I certainly didn't do it without talking to my brothers. Right, Naeem? I went, I shared what I thought God was saying. And it's so absolutely important that we walk and move in the body of Christ, especially in the hour that we're living in. But I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm totally, completely passionate about this message of the indwelling Christ. And I realize, uh, look at it this way. So Jesus, at the end of his ministry, he starts to tell them that the Holy Spirit's going to come and it's all going to go inside now. He, did, he waited because they couldn't handle it early in his ministry. It took a long time for, for Jesus to be able to bring them to the place where he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to be in you now. Now, do you understand how foreign that is to Jews? There was no such thing as God living inside of you. He lived in that special little room and, and you had to be real careful. Where you, once a year, one person could go in and we were worried about him all the time. He had a rope on him. If he said, you know, he did the wrong thing, we were in trouble, right? Why am I so dry? Is it dry in here? Mm, just me, huh? Uh, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm good. I'm going to need one of those. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, thank you, Neil. So, so, so think about that. So, so now the big fight goes on. Look at Galatians. Now the apostle Paul is the one. God didn't go to the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles. Didn't go to them. Uh, he goes to the the craziest, most evil uh, uh, guy you can think of, when you think of Saul of Tarsus, when you think of Saul of Tarsus, I mean, the rest of the Pharisees weren't as crazed about the Christians as he was. He was crazed about these Christians. He was so incensed about this message, about this man that they were treating. Uh, the Jews wouldn't think of looking at a human being and saying, God, and this crazy guy had the nerve to tell people he was. Can you imagine? You know, when you come to know the Lord, the first thing you learn 
is he's not who you thought he was. He's not who you thought he was. And getting to know the Lord, you know, yeah, that's the topic, isn't it? Getting to know, the, let me make sure I come back to that again about the internal rather than the external. Getting to know the Lord. The church is really confused about this because we talk about the knowledge of the Lord. Listen, in the garden there were two trees. It was the knowledge of good and evil and it was life. You see, there was always going to be knowledge, but your knowledge would come through life, and it would come through intimacy, and it would come through relationship. It wouldn't come from an independent you that would have your own knowledge. Does that make sense? Knowledge apart from your intimate relationship with Jesus is dangerous. Is dangerous. That's why half the church is fighting with the other half of the church, right? So this message, the mystery that's hidden before the foundation of the world, Paul says, God raises up this apostle, meets him on the road to Damascus. Oh, I heard something really interesting. I don't want to get waylaid. But I read somewhere, and I'm going to investigate it so all you Bible scholars can help me with it. But I have some, there's some credible reasons to believe that Stephen was in the congregation, Paul's congregation in Tarsus, when, before he, when he was a Jew, when they were Jew, when Jews, when, when Paul was a Jew, Saul was a Jew, they lived in the same area. So somebody, some, some person I listened to said, can you imagine Paul with his big ego and this young person comes in talking about the Messiah, Stephen, not only talking about the Messiah, but having power in his life. Could you imagine how that incensed the apostle? I think it's probably, I'm going to investigate it, come back, and I'll tell you. Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. So now Paul is raised up to bring this message to Jews and, and, and Gentiles that God has always had a plan in his heart since before the foundation of the world that God would live in human beings. So not only are human beings on the highest, are on the highest rung, rung of humanity when the cre first creation, but now, can you imagine? God's plan was always to live in them, never to be apart from them, separated Life, a human living life, separated from God, unheard of, evil. That's what the world is right now. You want to know why we're not? You'll never get it together. No politician, no government will ever get it together. You can't get it together if you're human beings without Christ. You're not, never made to live without Christ. You aren't made to be an independent self. self. So now... You have all the battle in the... Somebody tell me there's not warfare in this life. Somebody tell me. Warfare all through the New Testament. Uh, even Paul and Peter are fighting with one another. And Paul's got... He's annoyed at John Mark. Remember that whole thing? And they had to work through things. How many, how many people are there really struggling about your relationships? That there's relationships in your life that are really... Hey, a lot of life is struggling with relationships, guys. A lot of life is struggling with relationships. So we see this battle go on. We see this go on. And now let me take you to the reformers in the 16th century. Now, you know, if I went around the room and asked you what was the biggest thing that the, reform, the reformers came in to the medieval church and said, this, is, this, is, this isn't God. This is, this is false worship. This is, first of all, they had assurance of salvation at the end they, they, they were horrified at the thought that you would tell people that they're justified by faith alone when you come to Christ and know your sins are forgiven. So let's just start there. But most of us would think that's what Martin Luther's, you know, that of course that's crucial to Martin Luther's message, that we're saved by faith and not by works. But guys, that wasn't just it. Because one of the things that they were battling they were battling, guys, the kingdom of God is within you. This is an internal Jesus lives his life through us. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. This is an internal life. 
This is no more temples and, and, and priests and sacrifices and uh, uh, all that went with the, with the, with the temple. Hol special holidays, special people. And so the reformers came on and they said, what are we doing? We're going, we're, we're going off the cliff because here we are again. It's a matter of now it was no longer Worship was now visual. It was now um, um, sensory. Uh, now it was, here we go again. Let's go outside. Let's go, let, let's go find God outside. Now it's what you see the man up there do. Now it's what the man up there is wearing. Now it's what the man touches. Who can touch those things? Oh, no, no, no. You can't touch those things. You can't touch who touches it, when they touch it, how they touch it, what they're wearing when they touch it. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. How outside could you get? So here we go. The church starts to go down this road, and now we're external. Everything's external. External. Evangelicals are doing it. We're doing it ourselves. Now, now. We watch the, peep, the choir, the medieval church, we watch the choir in their different garb. And they didn't sing because the choir sang, right? It wasn't congregational. It wasn't participatory. It was, right? It, it was, you belong there, and we belong here, and you have to go through us for everything. Religion, it's called. Let me ask you a question. You know, religion, I'm probably throwing so many people crazy about re the word religion. Religion just means you're doing by your own self-effort what you can never do that you need the life of God to do. You can't save yourself. How many know, how many know you can't save yourself? How many, you can't save yourself from your sins? How many know that? So why do we think that after I got saved from my sins, I can now live a life all by myself. So we, we're taught that, you know, we're forgiven of our sins, but we're not taught anything about how to live life. Live life from the, from the life. And I'm concerned as a mother. I'm concerned that some of you won't hear this. I'm concerned that some of you, you know, the Apostle Paul said, he said, sorry. I decide, uh, what's the, I forget the verb, the adverb in there. I choose to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. So why, if Christ is the, if Christ is, everything is going to be summed up in Christ. If everything's going to be summed up in Christ, this isn't really about us first. This is about God getting his plan. It's about, it's about God getting what he wants. It's, what was that before I said that? I went, I went off track. Um, yeah, yeah. It's about his life. And we, and the church, we're so, the enemy and the warfare, religion, listen, you had the prodigal son, right? He took, he took his, his inheritance and went out and sinned up a storm, right? He went out and sowed his oats. Yeah, well, we call that bad. He was a bad kid, right? Yeah, well, then you got the elder brother who was better than him, right? He just stayed home and was self-righteous. And his picture of his father was just, was worse than his brother's picture of the father. But he wanted, it was going to be by his self-effort. And he was looking, the, the young son was looking to a dead world to give him what he wanted. But the elder brother was looking to a dead self to give him what he wanted. You know, saints,
So it's a flesh and the spirit. It's such words that seem like that it makes it so sound so super spiritual, but in such reality. You know, do you know what most of what flesh really is most of the time? It's if I can't, I can't trust God to give me my needs, I'm gonna go get my needs met myself. I'm gonna I'm asking you. With the stress and pressure that's in this world that is climbing and not, not about to stop anytime soon, where do you go to relieve your stress? Because you better find out, and you better know where, because your flesh will go to, what kind of things does my flesh go to? Oh, come on, don't always sit there, look so super spiritual to me. You know what I'm talking about. Where is our flesh tempted to go? The refrigerator, the bottle, the, you name it. Feed it, numb it, do something to it. Give me a pill. Do something. Am I talking to anybody here? Listen, Abraham, he got into the promised land and God said, Abraham, you're in, uh, here, stay in this land. Don't leave the land. So what happened? Famine came on the land. And what did Abraham do? Did he trust God? No. He, like he was like you and me. He decided, I don't know, maybe God didn't hear that prayer or... Maybe God's asleep somewhere, or, you know, I must not have done it right. Maybe I didn't hear it right. And so he goes, he takes his bride, and boy, do they get in trouble. And now the bride is in danger. And when you leave where God has put you in Christ, this is where the devil is just aching to get a hold of us. Listen, I am not up here talking about being in Christ because I need some new theology or I need some new, you know, pet thing to keep people interested. This is the heart of Christianity. That's my first job. Every time I talk, I'm going to, anytime I have a mic in my hand, I'm going to be saying the same thing. The church, we haven't understood it, and we've taught people, we just go, Externally, again, what you do, pay your tithes, go to meetings. Uh, you know, none of these things are bad in themselves, but when everything you do is external and you don't know how to touch Christ inside you, then you just walk out the door on Sunday afternoon and go back to live like everybody else does on Monday through Saturday. Come on. And not because you want to either. Not because you want to. Because you don't know how to do it any differently. And that's where the church, this is where the devil. Guys, I turn, I'm not even going to give you his name. <sighs> but I, I don't know. In a state of madness, I turned on a YouTube from a very, very popular, my brother's laughing. Very, very popular evangelical. If I told you his name, you'd be like, oh, I'm sure you, I'll leave it right there. Um, ten years ago, we had a very popular book. <laughs> okay, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop right now. Um, guys, I was horrified. You know why? Because he talked, I don't know, he was talking about Changing your thoughts or changing your feelings. Now, he, he talked about one week, he talked about this and the other week. I, I, you know what? I, I was so incensed after I, I got away from it, I kind of don't remember it too clearly. I was, and he talked about what would Jesus do? Remember the bracelet? He, well, he actually was teaching this. Well, in this situation, what would Jesus do? Would he, would he do this? And I was like, here we go. Here we go. This is the message that we've gotten. What do you mean, what would Jesus do? I, sometimes I'm looking for his life inside of me. He shocks me a lot of times when he lives through me in ways I never expected him to live through me. I have learned more about the Lord. My knowledge has come from watching him live through me. And say, like, what? You, why are we doing that? Or change my feelings uh, about a person or a thing. 
and you realize how real he is inside of us. How real his life is. You know, looking at Luke 21. No, I didn't want to go there. How about Jeremiah 17? How about Jeremiah 17? Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat comes. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Psalm 1 tells us the same thing about a tree planted by the waters. What are they talking about? They're talking about that. No, he's talking about no matter what the circumstances are, whatever is going on around this tree, if it is a tree that has roots into tapping another source uh, underneath, if its roots are grounded and rooted into something else, then no matter what's happening, whatever drought is going on around it, its leaf will not its leaf will not go dry and it will still bear fruit. And Jesus, what did he say? What did he say? Come to me and uh, he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Guys, we can't just live just having an intellectual relationship with Jesus. We've got to know him and we've got to know him in our spirit. We've got to know how to contact him in our spirit. Listen, as I was looking at Luke 21, you know, Luke 21 is the corollary passage to Mark, Matthew 24, where it talks about the end times. And it goes on and on. And let me just read you a few verses. Yeah, you see, I'm rebelling against the overheads. And Mike was so good. He told me what to do. I'm rebelling. I'm rebelling. Uh, I wish people had Bibles in their hands. Sorry, I do. But I guess I'm old enough to feel that way. Um, and he's talking about, you know, this is kind of like, this is kind of like a, a PS to Pastor James's messages these last weeks. We don't want to be a bunch of independent people getting up here and he's got his, pan his thing and he's pre preaching that and, you know, somebody else, Naeem, Ted, me, somebody gets up, Joe, we all say something. What is the Lord saying? That, that's, that's the point. And I want to say that as we listen to the pastor talk about the revelation and all the different views there are about it and how, you know, how mesmerizing it all is and and all that goes on with trying to understand the book of Revelation, I have, you know, spent 50 years trying to come to my own conclusions about it. But, you know, the Apostle Peter says, he says, 2 Peter, he says, in light of all the things that are going to happen when the, the earth and the, and, the, and the heavens are removed, what kind of people ought we be in light of all that's happening? And that's my question to us this morning. In light of all that's going on in the news, in light of all that's going on in the world we're living in, what manner of people ought we to be? And he goes on to say, and see that you be found in him at peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I spent a whole lot of my Christian life knowing about peace, but not really understanding much, and not really how do I put it, not always identifying what peace felt like. Part of this is really um, an introduction to my next Wednesday meeting next month. Because we are going to talk about how you touch God and what peace is and how absolutely essential it is that we know. Do you see, guys, not all your emotions. We have fallen emotions, emotions that we have we have um, cultivated from our fallen life, from our flesh. But do you know what the emotions we're to be looking to live in? The fruit of the Spirit. 
That's his emotion. That's his emotions. Not only the fruit of the Spirit, but his nature. So the other day I got quiet, and I sat down, and I went before the Lord, and I, I, went, to, I went to touch him in the Spirit, as we're going to talk about next, next month. And I had the most amazing sense of the Lord's comfort in me. I felt so comforted by him. But it's a nuance of getting to learn him. It's a nuance of getting to learn what it feels like in your spirit. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think me sitting there and reading about Jesus uh, and, the, and the Holy Spirit being a comforter, do you think that would have mattered as much to me as what happened to me during that time? Huh? I mean, I didn't just read it. He's a person who lives inside of you, who feels inside of you, who thinks inside of you. You know, what is transformation? Let me ask. What's your definition? We all know. I'm going to be transformed. You know, Apostle Paul said, I pray that, uh, that Christ be formed in you. He didn't say just get born again and get his life. He said, no, no, no. I'm praying. I travail, actually, he said, until Christ be formed in you. What is transformation? Unfortunately, from a lot of the circuits that we come out of and the churches that we've touched and a lot of our roots, which I have to say, I have, I wish I saw some differences in, but the way that, that, we're, that we're led to understand these things and to learn to, transformation is always, and God's going to come in outside and we're going to have a breakthrough when we're praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to come and, am I crazy? Always outside and we're always soon going to break through. You never break through, but I've been around 50 years and I know we're all ready to break through anytime. It's 50 years, guys. This is what transformation is. Biblical transformation. Jesus lives in your heart, uh, in your spirit, and we're going to talk about the heart starting next month because it, he's revolutionizing life. Uh, it, how many people know, if you've hung around with me, how many years have I been talking about I have to understand the heart? 40? 45? Yeah, about that. Okay. This is what transformation is. He lives in my spirit. But he wants to, Ephesians 3 says that we would make a home in our heart for him. You know what that means? His life wants to spread out in my mind, in my thoughts, that I'm thinking his thoughts. I love the, somebody said, let's lose our minds. Yeah, let's lose our minds. <laughs> that he would, my thoughts would be his thoughts. When that happens, right, it's so stunning that my emotions would be, he'd be able to feel through me like he did that last week when I felt comfort. I was able to feel his feeling. And then your will. The reins, the reins of your heart is your will. Listen, we sang that lovely song, Michael, you did a great job. Where's Michael? Is he still here? Michael, you know, it said... What about opening our hearts? He said, and this is my question. How do you open your heart? How do you do that? He wants to make a home in my heart. And remember, C.S. Lewis says, the real you is waiting for you in Christ. And all the religion that wants to scare you about when Christ wants to take over your life. Really? Really? Because I mentioned to the Wednesday group a few years ago, the Linda that I remember was so r rattled with anxieties and fears. And all I can say is over the period of time that he has 
been transforming my life and my thinking and my emotions, I would want to go back to her for all the tea in China. The real you is waiting for you in Christ. When you're living in the old man, that old you that's connected to that connection to the first birth, and you, you're not living in the reality of walking in the spirit and knowing who you are and walking in the new creation, who cares about giving that person up? You know something, guys? Give me a time. Somebody, Ted, make sure you give me, stop me now. It's time already. It's over. Oh, okay. L l stop me. Um, you know, the Bible says, Jesus says that we should cast all our cares on him, right? Oh, boy. Oh, Joanne, I'm glad that you feel that way. <laughs> cast all your care on him because he cares for you. And actually says, humble yourself. So pride is not giving him your cares. Right? Do you know what I found out? My biggest burden is Linda. Your biggest burden is you. Not the devil. It's not you, honey. It's not you. <laughs> Despite all the things I've said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Type. It's on tape. I don't think, and, and maybe you don't understand what I'm saying because it takes, it takes experience to understand that. Like, for instance, you know, you've got your soul and your spirit. You know, like Peter with his soul is on top of the Mount of Transfiguration saying, oh, this is great. We really belong here. This is wonderful. Let's build a building here. And remember, there's a voice out of heaven that says, Peter, shut up. Listen to him. If you let your soul, you let your soul lead your life emotionally, mentally, or in any way. So yesterday, I was having a little battle with my soul and spirit yesterday getting ready for today. And, oh my gosh, I just, the gospel, the, the gracious God that we have, the freedom we have in Christ. Once I stopped and said, oh, wait a minute, what, what, I'm not, she's not my problem. She's your problem, and you better get the girl together. Now, you may laugh at that, but I ought to click my heels after that. It comes back to me sometimes. When I'm, when I'm worried about something, when I'm stressed about something, oh, listen, thank God you got rid of this girl, Lord. That's all I can say. That's not who I really am, Lord. Who I really am is you in me. Now, this is what I want you to know we're going to be talking about next, next month. Joanne, you remember. One day I was up in my bedroom in some sort of emotional pain. I don't remember what it was. I would tell you. Maybe. I don't know. But I remember being in such... Listen, I'm going to give you information that's going to tell you that you don't just have a mind here. You have a mind in your gut. Did you know that? That we are, we are literally made when a baby's born, there's a a cutoff. I'm going to let you read it. There's literally, we wonder why we hear so much about stress in our stomach, because there is a mind here, too. We're going to talk more about that. So one day I was in a lot of pain, in my emotion, uh, emotional pain in my bedroom. And don't ask me, because it had to be Christ that just took over, because I never thought about it. I didn't try to figure it out. I didn't know what my theology was. I walked out of that bedroom, and I said, and get out of my stomach right now. Joanne, you remember? And the strangest thing happened. I had instant peace. Okay, you can either walk out of here and say, she's a loony, now that's it, she stepped over the line. I'm telling you, this is your spirit, and we don't even know where our spirit is. You know where our spirit is? Right here in your belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And in case you think I'm making this up, I'm going to give you tons of scripture verses that are going to tell you about bowels, and it's going to tell you... We are, where do you think the spirit is? If, don't, don't, if I were to ask you right now, just answer yourself. You don't have to tell me. If you were to say right now, where is the spirit live in you? Some people are here. My heart. No, not this heart, guys. This, your heart is here. 
Your heart is here with the Spirit. I'll give you scripture verses after scripture verses after scripture verses. People think it's all the Spirit is here. Well, of course, it, your Spirit takes over your whole body. And so he is affecting all of you. But we've, how, no wonder we're so confused about how to connect with God. How to connect with God. Can I tell you, it could be made so simple. It's going to floor, it's going to floor those that are willing to come in with an open mind. Learning to connect with God in your spirit. So it's a face-to-face. -face. It's a contacting him. It's not just a cerebral thing. But since my mind is connected to my emotions, I'm not throwing out the mind at all. Thank God. Thank God for the Baptists that have hold. Thank God for the people that have hold the held the ground for the word of God. The word of God is our foundation. And once we get off in some crazy prophetic nonsense where everything is about visions and words and we're off the word of God, let me out of there. But that does not mean that having the word of God, you don't need the Holy Spirit as well. I don't know. You all look so strange. You know, what kind of bill processing, right? Well, really, what I'm here to say is I want us to. This is an, the kingdom of God is within you. So don't you think. If Christ lives in me, don't you think that should be the actual greatest emphasis that the church should be talking about? D d uh, hello? So when I listened to this brother the other day, and he's, he, any unsaved person could have taken what he said, and it would have helped them. It was totally the soul. It was totally what, you know. Just about how you change your thoughts. Well, any unsaved person, you don't need a spirit life. You don't need Christ inside of you to know, to say, I, have to, I want to change my thinking. That's why people are sitting on therapist couches all over. Right? But we're not just a soul. We're not just a mind. We have a spiritual life. And that's why Romans 8 is the absolute pinnacle of the whole Bible, if you ask me. It's now the spirit filled, the person, the, the treasure in the earth, earthen vessel. It's learning how to walk in the spirit and, and have your mind set on the spirit, which is life and peace. And do you know when your mind leaves that? Do you know what it feels like in your life when you're out of that? If the spirit in your mind is life and peace... Don't you think we ought to be people who are conscious of, uh-oh, I just, I, just, I just slipped right back into the flesh just now. So, so, so this is what I'm saying, guys. J just as somebody who cares about you, you have a decision to make. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You've got to decide if what I'm telling you is the truth because there's no middle ground with what I'm telling you. I'm saying that knowing Christ's indwelling life in your life, knowing how to follow him, knowing how to hear him, knowing how to be led by him is the most important thing. Nothing else in your life is more important. And Luke 21 says, in light of all these things that are happening, let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. And I'm going to close with this. Luke 21. He's talking about the end times where pastor's been talking about. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. And he spoke to them in a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees. And when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. You know, many people believe, I do. That, that that tree is a picture of the Jewish nation. It depicted all through the word of God as a fig tree. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all is fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Okay, now this is for us. And take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting 
and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day comes upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Here we go. Drunkenness. What, what does that mean? It means you're, you're, you're looking somewhere else for relief in the pressure. Why do you think, saints, why do you think everywhere you go they're talking about mental health? Why do you think everywhere you sit down with a, a nurse or a doctor, they say, now, have you been depressed? Have you been thinking of taking your life anytime recently? When did we ever ask people these questions? When will we ever ask them? Do you think this is going to get better? It isn't going to get better. This mental health crisis is because God is allowing humanity to be seen in the, in, in the real, light of reality what it is without him. You think you can do without me? There you go. Have at it, guys. Because you know what? If he didn't do it, then we'd all turn around and say, well, you know, we didn't know. You know, well, he's, there'll be nobody who'll be able to say, argue with him. You think that he's, he's so sweet. So this is my, this is my word to you today and to me, starting with me. The cares of this life. It's Mark 4 when the seed is planted. You know the seed that's planted? The seed that's planted is the revelation of Christ in you. The seed that's planted is now who you are in Christ. You are holy. You're beloved. You're justified. You're, you're, your sins are forgiven. This is the New Testament Christianity. You are the beloved of God. Now, when that seed wants to germinate and take over your heart, the cares of this life, the birds in the air that want to, the powers around us who want to steal that the revelation from us. And he wants you and I to walk out of here today and live just like any other human beings. Now listen, if you really have the Spirit of God leading you, I can tell you this from experience with my spiritual mother, the most spiritual person I ever met. She wasn't fl flaky. She was the most down-to-earth person you ever want to meet. We have a treasure in an earthen vessel. You still are earthen vessel. You're still human. If there's somebody who's so spiritual and spooky, run. Because Jesus was not super spiritual. The sinners loved him. He was, they couldn't even figure out in the crowd, like, which one is he? Which one is he? He's that. Oh, the one with the halo. Yeah. Yeah, you see the one over there? The angels, the, the archangels, the light coming. To, none of that, guys. None of that. It's a, but it's a real life that you're called to, and I'm begging you. You see, with healing, and we're trusting for so many brothers and sisters in this place. See, I want us to see that physical healing, we're not just waiting for it to come out of the sky, which is a lot of churches, you know, we're going to come and the holy man and the, he's going to lay hands on me and I, I thank God. Listen, I want to tell you something. A lot of things that you're going on in your life, oh, I, this is another whole message. I got to stop. Things going on in your life right now that you're saying are problems. God is taking your heart out of the world. He's getting you to look to him and I hope you don't need a pig's pen. I hope I don't need a pig's pen because God doesn't run after you in the pig's pen. He lets you go to learn your lessons, right? But he loves you so much. I don't mean it in a, in a vengeful way. That's not his heart. His heart is, I love you so much, Linda. You're going the wrong way there. I got to let you find out. I got to let you find out this isn't, this isn't me. I want you to want me, Linda. I want you to want me. I want you to know me, Linda. That's what you were created for, and nothing else will satisfy you. And I want you to see that your kids and your grandkids and your, and your ministry and your friends and your, none of this stuff, as good as it is, is going to satisfy you. How much, Linda, I, Linda, I hope you get the message quicker. Why do you think so many of us are discouraged and disillusioned? Because he's breaking our illusions. 
that once I have this, I'll be happy. Once this happens, oh, this is everything's going to change. No, once I know Jesus more and more, that is what I was created for. But his life is in you. His life is in us. He doesn't want us looking outside. Lord, thank you. Your perfect life, your perfect health, you are perfect. Your life. Your, your life that went through death. Death couldn't touch it. Resurrection means it went through, life, went through death and death couldn't hold it so it came out. That's what resurrection life is. So if Mr. Resurrection, excuse me, who went to the grave and all the demons and they couldn't hold him and he came out and said to the devil, is that all you've got? If that life is in me, he wants, it, he wants you to know him in your healing. He doesn't want it to just be a thing, an external thing out here. I'm going to get a gift over here. I'm going to get healing over here and prosperity over here. No, I, will end up, I want you to know me. I want this can't be. You can't, I don't want to give you a gift that's not in me. Can anybody tell me? Is this making sense to you this morning? Okay, last thing. And, and, and this could be sermons all by themselves. You know the relationship problems we have? He puts your relationships to death. Did you know that? Because the cross and resurrection isn't just a one-time thing. It's the way God works. So you know what it means? You have a really good friend, and you have a bad time with each other. This never happened, Dana, because she's too nice. But, but you have a really bad time with each other. And all the things that go on when we're having a bad time with one another. But Christ is in it. And you come out the other side. And you've forgiven each other. You've whatever you need to do. Do you know what happens? Resurrection always means something's left behind. Resurrection means something dies that doesn't come out of the grave. So you know what happens? There's more of Jesus between you and I now than there was before. Before it was more solical. And I needed you to this, all the things I needed you to be my friend for and to agree with me about things. But once you go through death and resurrection with people, husbands, wives, there's more of Jesus in the relationship than there was before. And you don't need the person anymore like you needed them before. So now you're free to love them. You let them go. Okay, I don't know if it's going to work. Well, whatever. But then when you come back, Jesus is in the middle of that relationship. Does that make sense? I want you to think about that because it's going on in a lot of your relationships and you don't know where God is and you're crying out and why isn't he fixing this? And some of it is he wants you to understand that. He wants to be more in the middle of that relationship than he has been because you're both wrong and you're both right. We could stay here for a long time, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna close. Do we have time for the table or not? Yeah, we do? Okay. So, so really what this table means to me I need to partake of a life Christianity is about a life he didn't give me things he gave me himself guys do you understand do I understand do we understand that there was a day when Jesus Christ took his own blood and walked into the holy of holies in heaven with his blood and put can you imagine what that what would that look like a man walked into the holy of holies a human being of course he's god of course he was god too but he was also a human being and he walked into that holy of holies one day in heaven with blood and put it down for you, Joe, and you, Lee. And I want to see what the devil can possibly say to you after his blood is there on your behalf in, the, in heaven. Can you imagine that day? There's a man in heaven. There's a man seated 
on the throne. A man like us, our brother. You want to tell me you're a nobody? Excuse me. You're going to tell me you're just nobody and you're just happenstance in your life and yeah, you're not going anywhere and you're not too smart, you're not too this. I'm telling you that you have been called with the high calling of God to know Christ and to live a life in union with him. Maybe at the table today. Father, we pray, Father, for that revelation, that word coming forth from you, the word, your word, Father. You died to forgive us and you lived to overcome for us. I walked through those doors this morning when I tell you, I can't explain to you. I can't get two sentences straight. Joe, is it true? I had, we were up praying at three o'clock in the morning. I can't begin to, I telling you, I walked through those doors and say, Lord, either you're living in me or I'm done today. How did he do? I'm serious. This isn't to put attention on me. It's to tell you I'm living this. And it's freedom. It was like, okay. And during the night, I got hit with anxiety a few times. And it's not anxiety so much like it used to be. It's anxiety because I'm so passionate about you getting this. And I don't want to lose an opportunity to get a chance to let the Holy Spirit repeat and repeat this to you. Please don't settle for a religious Christian life. Please don't settle for less than this. Please don't let City on the Hill just become a religious congregation. Let me tell you something. The church are only those who are touching Christ. The real church are those in touch with Christ. We get together for meetings. We're supposed to be touching Christ. We're not here just to talk and give nice sermons. And, and, and thank God none of us leaders feel like that. We're all on the same page. But this talks about you need another life. And that life is always available to you. In grief and in all, in all of the areas of life. Lord, you took this from me. Oh, I got to stop because I have so many good things I want to say to you. Do you know that Jesus didn't just, he didn't just have you in him the last few days of his life. He didn't just see you the last few hours of his life. Do you know that when he came to live in you, hang on, because if somebody doesn't get up and scream, I don't, I don't understand, you, then I'm, you're not alive. Do you understand that when Jesus came to live in me, he brought all of his history with him? When he, when he stood against the powers, uh, 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 when he, his freedom, his confidence, his trust in God, he brings it all in me. He brings it in me. When he could stand up to suffering, he brings it in me. Oh, you're the spirit of Jesus, the spirit that went through this already. I don't have to do this. You come to live for me, Jesus. Oh, thank goodness, because I, I can't live this. I can't do this, Lord. Oh, that's right. That's right. You came to live my, your life through me. Did, did that touch anybody in here? Because I could go right through the ceiling myself. He brought his whole history with you. What do you think when he walked into the Holy of Holies? It was Jesus with all of his history and all that he was in his humanity and his divinity and walked into that holy place. You can tap that life at any time. Jesus, I, Jesus, I can't do this. I can't love this person. It's too difficult. I can't forgive this person. Oh, that's a specialty for him. Forgiveness, Lord, thank you. You live in me, and you're the great forgiver. I don't have to do it. Oh, I'm so glad because I can't. Will you forgive through me now, Lord? Forgive through me, Father. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. I'm just passionate about this Jesus, and I'm passionate about this message because it's the real gospel, and I want you to be passionate about it too. So now we're going we're gonna, to, I don't know what we're going to do, and I never know what we're going to do, but we're going to take the table, that's for sure. This is your life. And I pray that each of you heard something that you can take to this table. And I pray that some people in here say, I'm getting it. I gotta learn to live. I've gotta learn to live this life, learn to live with Jesus. Live, it, live out this union. Abide in me and I in you. The cottage, the, the little cottage in the, in the storm. 
That's being in Christ. He puts you in Christ. Stay in Christ. Abide in me. Don't come out. The devil wants you to feel separated. You're not who you with Jesus. Come on, Linda. Let's talk. Remember, yeah, remember, I think you should really be worried about this. Take a look at this going on in your life. Don't come out. Well, you know what? You better have to see Jesus because I'm in him. What do you think all of the references to he's a shelter, he's a high tower, he's a, he's a refuge? What do you think that means? It means that you are put in Christ by God, and we have to learn the life of living from that place. Does that make sense? You are in Christ Jesus. The most jack in your Bible study, I don't know what you're talking about there, but I'm saying as a pastor here, I want the in Christ message in everything and every Bible study. It has to be brought into everything in this church. Because the biggest, the biggest fact in the whole New Testament, how do I get out of myself? Oh, God put me in Christ. And now he put Christ in me. That is the foundation of the Christian life. Father, I pray as we take the table now together. This will not just be head knowledge for any of us, but this word will burrow uh, through the ground of our hearts and will bring forth fruit to you. That's what you died for. Do we want to do a song? Tommy, thank you. I love when you play. But you want, do we want to do a song? Let's do a song as people. Or is it too late? Is it too late? Kind of late? Okay. It's not too late. We'll play a song. If you have to leave, you're excused. Let, let's play a song. Any song you guys choose. And we're going to take this. So let's take the cup and let's take the juice. Lord, Lord you shed your blood. Not just to forgive me of my sins, although, wow, you did. But you, you came to redeem me and get me back to your original purpose, that I would have this life with you. And that I'd be redeemed from the land of the enemy, powers of darkness, power of sin. You see, Jesus came out of the tomb. Sin doesn't work. Sin has been found out. It's just a big flop. It's been exposed. Sin looks so big and it looks so powerful. It's just a big nothing. It was defeated on that cross. And Lord, we thank you as we take the, the wafer. Your body, everything was put into your body. You needed a human body. And it was all put in to your body. And so when we take this cup, when we take this wafer, we thank you. We're taking your life. This is, this is us. We're not back in the medieval church thinking that this is really your body and blood. We don't believe that, Lord. But we believe this is us. There's a spiritual transaction where we are declaring, I'm living from another life. I'm living from your life. Let's take it together. Now they're going to play a song. Thank you. Now we don't have altar calls around here much anymore. But if there's something about what you heard today, you want a few of us to stand with you, solidify with you, lay hands on you and say, this revelation, Lord, we are standing for this brother or this sister to have this revelation. I don't care if nobody comes up. I don't care. But if you want if somebody that you feel it's going to help solidify something for you, if you're not sure that you've given your life to Jesus, I mean, given your life, you know, when you totally give your life to Jesus, I mean, when it's really taken out of your hands and put in his, your, your problems are over. And a lot of Christians are going to God looking for prayers and answers, and they never really gave them their whole lives. And they think he looks bad, but really, he knows those that, that are his. So let's play this song. If you're one of those people that would like us to stand with you, we will do it. Be free. The rest of you.
Thank you for coming out on this snowy, icy day. I hope you found it worth it, and we will see you. Somebody else is going to follow me next week. It's going to talk, we're going to talk on the same vein. Amen.